Before we begin today's podcast, I wanted to answer the most emailed question that pops up in my inbox. Neil, how do you earn your living outside of this daily tech podcast? Well, seeing as you ask, if you're starting 2021 and have a long list of goals for the new year, but a lack of time to bring them to life, remember, you can work one-to-one with me in a number of areas. For example, if you want to hit record on a conversation in Zoom or Microsoft Teams, I can edit those files and help you launch your own podcast and help you have a show like this on Spotify, Apple Podcasts and all the usual platforms. Equally, if your leadership team needs help with ghostwritten thought leadership articles or you need someone to manage the content for your business blogs, pop by my website, techblogwriter.co.uk, where you'll find more information on how you can work with me. And you'll also find links to 1,500 interviews on the Tech Talks Daily Podcast, plus my shows with Netgear and Citrix. But enough from me. On with today's show. Welcome to the Tech Talks Daily Podcast, where you can learn and be inspired by real-world examples of how technology is transforming businesses and reshaping industries in a language everyone can understand. Here is your host, Neil C. Hughes. Welcome back to the Tech Talks Daily Podcast, and I'm going to be exploring the authentication and multi-channel security solutions landscape today and how they are attempting to make the digital world a safer place to be. And over the last few weeks, we've seen blackouts on the internet, Google going down, even big cybersecurity companies are being the victims of a hack. And in a recent Javelin report, it found that the account takeover fraud is trending at an incredible rate, up a staggering 72% over the last year. Initially, AI-driven behavioural biometrics was used to primarily prevent this type of fraud. So I've invited digital banking and payment expert Duold Nolte, Chief Strategy Officer at Intersect, onto the podcast today. And he believes that advances in AI will continue to drive more capabilities, but on its own behavioural biometrics. So I want to dive a little bit deeper into the work that they're doing, the story behind the company, and so much more. So buckle up and hold on tight as I beam your ears all the way to Atlanta, Georgia, so we can speak with him right now. So a massive warm welcome to the show. Can you tell the listeners a little about who you are and what you do? Sure. Yeah. So thanks for for inviting me, Neil. Uh, my name's uh, uh, Dewalt Nolte or Dewalt Nolte, I guess, uh, for for the English speakers. And uh, I'm the uh, uh, one of the co-founders and chief strategy officer for Intersect. Um, we're a fintech company that specializes in digital identity and authentication solutions for financial institutions primarily. And, uh, you know, our vision effectively is to make uh, the digital world a safer, more user-friendly place where users can benefit from the convenience really of transacting digitally without fear. Uh, you know, our company was, was really uh, started when uh, one of my co-founders' mother, actually her bank account was completely cleaned out without her knowledge. And uh, it's become our mission to make sure that no one else suffers that fate because that is a terrible thing, uh, you know, to open your bank account and there's nothing there. It really is. And, and just to set the scene there, can you tell me a little bit more about the scale of the fraud that you're you're seeing on the digital landscape right now and, and why both home users and business users alike need to take it more seriously? Yeah, and, and, and you know, it's 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 incredible to to see the sophistications, you know, of, of the attacks out there and, and, and just, you know, I guess the scale of it, right? Uh, we're seeing Really, really, uh, you know, simple attacks, uh, whereas you're also seeing really sophisticated ones. They're kind of, I think the interesting thing that we're kind of uh, seeing is that it really is opportunistic in nature, right? So it moves the whole time in terms of where the lowest hanging fruit is at that point in time. So today it might be, uh, you know, account takeover of a bank account, uh, you know, with a bank that maybe has some weak authentication policies in place, whereas tomorrow it might be, a COVID-19 stimulus package, right? Uh, that, that may be a high return opportunity. And I think the, the, the thing that we've seen in terms of the, the fraud trends out there, which as you can, uh, as you might know, with, with all the newspaper reports that are coming out, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's on the rise. You're seeing more and more account takeover fraud. You're seeing more, you know, payment attacks. It's definitely on the rise because as people go into the digital channels, there's, 
you know, there's more there for the fraudsters to go after. And of course, when you have opportunity, these guys will come to the party. Um, but we're seeing that the principles re largely remain the same, right? It's it's highly, um, even though the, the tools maybe become a bit more sophisticated, the underlying principles are fairly consistent. Now, if I, if I use a good example of this uh, that really stuck with me is, you know, a couple of years again, there was the LinkedIn breach, uh, you know, whether it was a big data breach in terms of LinkedIn credentials. And right after that breach, uh, there was a survey that was sent out to say, uh, you know, click on this link to see whether you were part of the, link, the LinkedIn breach. And of course, this link would then ask you to enter your username and password. And of course, you know, it was just someone that was opportunistically, uh, again, you know, even getting some more uh, username and passwords, harvesting that. So very opportunistic in nature, but the principle there being fishing for sensitive information uh, or creating urgency and panic. Those are still the tactics that these guys use typically to, uh, you know, to attack end users. And I think the, the important thing to realize or to remember is that in these situations, just use some common sense and, 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 and stay calm. And typically what you'll find is that the moment you show that, you know, you're educated in this space, they'll probably just go somewhere else because there are so many that, that are lower hanging fruit that they'll rather spend their time there than try to uh, convince someone that, that knows their, uh, you know, or knows about how to protect themselves. So I, I guess from my side, what I, what I would give uh, uh, as advice to users out there is to say, remain calm, right? If, if, if someone kind of, uh, you know, creates urgency, like you have to pay something right now, or you're, in, you're, you're uh, you know, you have to pay this or immediately, or we're going to cut you off, that kind of thing. When there's urgency, immediately that should be a red flag. And if someone's kind of asking you for sensitive information, like, your car details or, or something like that in, you know, where you wouldn't expect that it's a little bit out of place, immediately see that as a red flag. So keep common sense like that kind of with you. And then the other thing is strong multi-factor authentication on your accounts that are important, right? Money and that kind of thing. Those would be my three tips to really protect yourself against, uh, you know, your, your typical attacks. And I also read in a recent Javelin report that account takeover fraud is is trending at the highest loss rate, up a staggering 72% over the prior year. But do you have any insights that you can share around the findings in that report? Because it is a, quite an eye-opener, isn't it? Yes, absolutely. And I think, you know, it's it's a staggering number. And, and, and what the report also points out is that 47% of U.S. adults uh, have been in, uh, a victim of imposter scams, which, you know, is the, I guess, the American word for, for account takeover. Um, and that's unacceptably high. If you think about almost half the population being a victim of an attack, you, you know, that, that really means we, we need to do something about it. And if you, if you read the report further, the underlying cause of this seems to be the over-reliance on username and passwords without proper authentic and multi-factor authentication solutions in place. So this seems to be, you know, the unfortunate challenge that we're facing in the market where the implementation of multi-factor authentication remains elusive, you know, for, for the market at large. And I think that's that's kind of something that we really need to change uh, to, to address this problem. And as for yourselves, just for anyone that's tuning in and hearing about you guys for the first time, how are you tackling these problems that we're talking about here? And, and what is it that you would say that makes you unique from, from the other solutions that are, that are tackling this problem? Yeah, so, so an interesting thing that we're seeing in the industry is that the industry at large has tried to kind of um, avoid multi-factor authentication, right? Citing user experience as, as the reason for that. So they they try to avoid it at all costs. They'll try to use these silent uh, risk-based assessments in the background to really, um, you know, avoid having to do multi-factor authentication. And the unfortunate uh, result of that is that, well, first of all, more fraud has been introduced, uh, you know, as you can see in this, in this uh, uh, report. And that it really erodes the trust between consumers and service providers for, for digital services. Um, and ironically, this also introduces a, a new kind of friction, right? And, and they call it silent friction. And silent friction is something that uh, that you 
that's you know when a user basically a legitimate user is trying to perform a transaction or login and they get rejected without any reason as to why you're just you're trying to do a payment you are the account holder you are the card holder and they reject you um and 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 that really from a user's point of view is immensely frustrating and 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 the friction there i guess is a little bit more than just having to do something like authentication or good authentication um so how are we different and how have we tackled this problem where the industry at large have tried to avoid multi-factor authentication citing user experience we've kind of turned this thing on its head to say well what if we could fix the experience of multi-factor authentication so that you can do more of it get the benefits of it but without that that uh, user experience impact and that's been also our, our approach kind of over the last 10 years was to say well we're going to really focus to make that experience as good as possible and if we can achieve that that would really solve the problem and we have really seen that i think you know when we uh, launched with our first client we saw a 99.9% reduction of fraud uh, you know, on their online banking channel. And the reason it wasn't 100% is for that year, they were measuring, they launched in March. And of course, uh, you know, up until March, they'd already had some fraud. So that wasn't 100% for the year, but we completely stopped it. And that was just because you can do it with a good user experience. So I guess, you know, where we really have performed some magic and, and something we're really proud about is we have a form of almost always on multi-factor or continuous multi-factor, if you will. So everything that you do with our system is inherently kind of provides multi-factor authentication. But what where we differ is, uh, you know, we've got an active way where you where the user has to do something or even a frictionless or a passive way, but they're always multi-factor. And I think that's something that we're really proud of we, because that means that you get the benefit without the user impact. And I think initially AI-driven behavioral biometrics was used primarily to prevent that type of fraud. But can you tell me more about how recently your application has expanded to identity proofing, especially in light of the massive data breaches, and, and, and to do that, to mm -hmm. enable risk-based authentication inside payment apps? Because, again, that feels quite a, a game-changer moment there. Yes, and I think, you know, you're, one of the big challenge, uh, you know, with your machine learning and AI, uh, you know, solutions is the fact that it tends to be reactionary, right? So uh, in order to learn about when something is, you know, bad behavior, you kind of need a couple of positive cases first, right? And, and, and that's the challenge. So I think what, you know, what the approach that we've been doing there is to say, well, if we combine the technologies, uh, you know, to have your your uh, combination of something like a strong authentication solution uh, while your system learns in the back end and you know you can combine when there's a little bit of doubt in your risk uh, assessment of a transaction that you can leverage the strong authentication capabilities that active engagement with the user to enable them to confirm in real time that it's them doing a transaction i think that capability um, you know really has enabled us to 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 get to a point where you can really remove the fraud from the from the transactions uh, and still, you know, use the benefits of of these, uh, you know, of the AI driven technologies. Because over time, you learn, but you never have the, um, you know, the, let's say, uh, the bad examples, right? So the the bad examples that typically learn uh, the AI models without the combination of the technologies. Uh, that really means that someone has to suffer fraud first before the machine learning. Uh, engine can actually identify that as bad. Um, so we've been able to kind of enable that without the the downside, right? So leveraging our strong authentication capabilities for those uncertain moments to make sure that those are also secure. So I think that's been a, a great way to, to, to really make sure that that journey is always secure. And, um, you know, I think at the end of the day, where we're quite excited about that is that we've also been able, as a part of that, to over time, as the machine learns and 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 the, you, know, um, you know the models learn to remove some of them the active um, um, the active instances of the authentication journey, uh, you know, so that but 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 not to compromise the security because now you have enough context to actually have uh, you know strong authentication without user 
uh, intervention necessarily being required. So do you think that advances in AI will continue to drive even more capabilities, but also why on its own behavioral biometrics isn't multi-factor authentication? Yeah, absolutely, right. So I think AI machine learning side, you know, on that side, something like behavioral biometrics really brings a, di- a new dimension to authentication solutions. Um, it enables us to start kind of identifying some of these more advanced attacks that typically we, we couldn't do before. Something like social engineering, which is very difficult to, to, uh, you know, to protect against because typically you're now involving the human in the loop. And, and typically the human, you know, is, is, is where uh, the weakness in an authentication system sometimes sit because I can convince you to give me your password or I can convince you to give me your PIN number. And that really makes it difficult to protect against because, you know, how do you protect a house if, if the owner is willing to give the keys, uh, you know, to the house, uh, to someone else? So I think that's been a, a big challenge. But what behavioral biometrics and, and, and AI technology actually now enables us to do is to start picking up uh, when something like that might be in flight. And that really is exciting because now that enables us to also protect users, even in these cases where someone's actually convincing you to hand over the keys to the kingdom, we're able to detect that in real time and you know protect the user from from that attack, which is really exciting. That's something new um, that 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 really I think is a game changer. Um, and then maybe to the second part of your of your question to say, well, you know, behavioral biometrics on its own, why that's not considered to be multi-factor. So if you think about multi-factor authentication, uh, if you think about the foundational elements of what constitutes multi-factor authentication, it's that there are three you know, pillars uh, or foundational categories that you require to be multi-factor. It's a, one is a possession factor or something that you have. Um, so that's a, a physical possession factor that the user owns that's unique to them. So it's a, you know, like a phone or a key or something like that something that you know, uh, so something that only the account holder would, would, would know, like a PIN or a password, and then something you are, so an inherence factor such as biometrics. Now, behavioral biometrics falls into that last category. And if you think about a multi-factor, a multi-factor means that you have to use a factor f- uh, from more than one of these uh, you know, categories. So for example, I'll do a possession factor and an inherence factor or a possession factor and a knowledge factor. So something I have and something I know makes it multi-factor. And so from there, you can see that behavioral biometrics on its own just uh, ticks one of the of the categories of multi-factor. And, and therefore, on its own, it doesn't qualify as multi-factor authentication. So you still need to combine it with a possession factor or a knowledge factor. And then something just to kind of note there is, that industry best practice and what we've also seen kind of over the last 10 years that we've learned is that a possession factor is actually quite important when it comes to multi-factor. So um, a possession factor is the one thing that really enables you to protect against an attack at scale. So if you think about knowledge or inherence, that's something that someone would be uh, able to copy or, or replicate from a remote location uh, and use that against you without your knowledge. So if I'll, I'll, I'll give the example to say, let's say a PIN or a password. If someone were to see your username or your password or steal that with a phishing site, you might not know that your password is compromised and that someone else has that. But a possession factor, let's say a, a mobile phone or a, or a key, if someone were to steal that, I would notice that it's gone. And that's a very, very important thing when it comes to security. And also, uh, when it comes to a remote attack, if you have to have something that's in my possession, that really makes it impossible for you to attack me without having that, which means that your scope of attack, you'd probably have to do a very targeted attack to, to, to kind of either steal my phone from me or something like that. And that means that you cannot really do an attack at scale. So that's really important. So using a possession factor in combination with something like behavioral biometrics is is really strong. And a question I've got to ask on behalf of everyone listening that have had bad experiences before when security gets involved, can it be achieved without impacting the user experience? Because it is an incredibly fine balance, isn't it? Absolutely. And, And look, I think 
the trick is to realize that uh, a user experience is subjective, right? Um, what I perceive to be a good a user experience may be very different from what you perceive to be good. Uh, we probably just need to look at how we set up our mobile phones as home screens, right? Uh, yours will probably look very different than mine. Uh, and, and I think that's something that's, that's really important to realize. So, and I mentioned this because it's important to empower the clients with the tools to craft the best possible user experience. Um, I may, for example, really like and, and perceive it to be a good user experience if I get challenged every single time I do a transaction. That might be something that I like, whereas you might only want to be challenged uh, if you know there's something like a, a transaction that's higher than a thousand pounds, as an example, and you wouldn't want to be bothered with anything lower than that. And that's a preference, and you need to be able to enable users to have the tools to, to craft that user experience, uh, you know, without, of course, um, you know, impacting their, their user experience. So using the right tools uh, in, the, in the appropriate way in a user journey is how you really ch achieve that. So um, if, if I, for example, have the, um, let's take a, a practical example here to say, let's say you, you are saying that something below a thousand pounds shouldn't be challenged, but we, with the tools that we have in place, can still detect that, wait a minute, here's a transaction that's lower than your limit, but that, that doesn't look legitimate based on what we know about how you usually transact. In that case, you still want to be able to say, well, here I'm going to challenge because that uh, there's reason for us to do that. And I think that's the point here is to say, you can really imp implement a, a solution that that uh, you know complies or conforms to a user's uh, preferences, but still kind of protects them when the need comes. And and I'm sure that if if there's a transaction that you didn't initiate that's uh, below your limit, and I, I I bother you in that case, that you wouldn't uh, mind too much to say, yeah, uh, thank you for that. It wasn't me. I love that. And it is amusing how different that page one of uh, smartphones looks. If you look at everyone, it, there's all slightly different. And I think you can tell a lot about a person by page one of their smartphone. But yes. in situations, though, where user interaction and data is limited, are, are there any other options than, than forcing users to adapt to new technology? Yes, and I think you know it's when you when you look at 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 something like a, a new user journey. Um, what you want to try and do is to to leverage some of the assets that you already have. So, for example, using the fact that uh, you know, let's say something like an online banking login, uh, there might be some assets, uh, you know, something like a, a mobile phone or a browser that. That I already have uh, as a as a factor that or, or a trusted factor that I know about about you as a user, and maybe I can leverage that if you're doing maybe something like a payment. So so leveraging you know what's available to you already from the user is is one way. So that cross channel benefit that you can create that you can get uh, is is something that that really enables us to 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 really do that to make sure that the user journey is really good. Um, and, and that we can remove some of the friction, uh, you know, from their journeys. And I think the other thing is, is, is in this case, if there is a new technology that you are introducing, um, make sure that in that case that you use the appropriate tools. So we see so many times that, you know, there's almost a preconception that, okay, uh, for this user journey, I'm going to use behavioral biometrics, uh, you know, and, I'm going to try and use it for as many use cases as, as, as I want to, uh, or as, as I can rather. Um, and what then happens is if the user journey, for example, in that case, doesn't have enough data points, you know, to really uh, get a good user, uh, uh, a behavioral uh, biometrics, uh, you know, user journey, from that point of view, you're actually now introducing friction to the user where he really has to go through extra steps just in order for you to use that technology. And I think it's important in those cases to make sure that you really um, use the appropriate tool. Maybe something like a fingerprint is, is better in such a case. I'm just using an example. So I think to, to kind of come back to that is to say, use as far as you can, um, you know, assets that you've established with the user already 
uh, maybe you can leverage from other interactions that you've had with the user. And if, it, if you can't, make sure that when you do have to introduce a, a new technology that you use the appropriate tool for that journey to make sure that you don't force a strange or, or, or clunky user experience. And I think we've uh, all given too much airtime for 2020 this year, but we're now heading to 2021. So I've got to ask, what trends are you going to be monitoring in the industry? And is there anything that will be your your primary focus in 2021? I appreciate you probably can't share too much, but is there anything you can? Sure, yeah. Um, so I think, you know, a big focus for us will will, will definitely be moving you know, the industry towards next generation of authentication. I think there's there's still a big over-reliance on username and passwords only. So there are a number of initiatives of moving, you know, that uh, away from that towards uh, more appropriate kind of authentication technologies for users. So that's a big trend at the moment that we're, that we're busy with. And then I think the other two that's really topical at the moment is privacy, right? So there's a strong uh, move towards privacy where users kind of want to be in control of you know, what data and, and what personal information is, is shared. So having that control, there is a big, uh, you know, there's a big trend there that where we uh, have some good solutions to, to help uh, enable that. And I think the other one is payments modernization. So, you know, we're, we're basically moving from your old payment systems towards a more digital payments uh, network. And I think from that point of view, again, there are some really, really good uh, technolo te technological capabilities that we have to really, uh, you know, land a slick user experience. And I think th those are the three trends probably that we will really be working closely, uh, you know, to kind of get, get the industry to adopt. Well, I've loved chatting with you today, but before I do let you go, could I ask that you remind everyone listening of, of where they can find you online if they did want to carry on the conversation we started today? If you want to have more information just on the company and what we do, uh, www.entersect.com. So that's E-N-T-E-R-S-E-K-T.com. But also on LinkedIn and Twitter, you can find me under my first name and last name. So DeWalt, so D-E-W-A-L-D, Nolte. Um, so I think... N O L T E. That's uh, for for Twitter and LinkedIn. You know, would please reach out. It would be great to to kind of hear, uh, you know, engage and, and and hear what problems we can help resolve. Well, I love chatting with you today. There's so many great topics there on where we're heading in security, and I think this this conversation is going to only evolve further in 2021 and i'd love to get you back on and see what direction it's heading there but especially as you guys are the pioneers in next generation authentication and mobile app security i think we've only just scratched the surface today so i'd love to get you back on next year but more than anything just a big thank you for taking the time to speak with me today thank you very much neil i'd love to 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 take the conversation forward and thank you for having me today it's been great to to discuss these topics very passionate about them. So many great points there about authentication and multi-channel security solutions and how they are making the digital world a safer place to be. But in order for it to enhance user experiences rather than negatively impacting them, and like I said, that is a hard balance to achieve. So I'd best to look with that one, guys. But if you do have any comments or questions, email me now, techblogwriter at outlook.com, LinkedIn or Twitter. Just look for at Neil C. Hughes. So all that's left for me to say is a big, genuine thank you to each and every one of you for tuning in. And I hope you join me again tomorrow. But until next time, don't be a stranger. Thank you for listening to the Tech Talks Daily Podcast with Neil C. Hughes. Remember, technology works best when it brings people together.